G'day guys and gal. Although on paper the Horus Heresy should have been a stomp for the Loyalists since it was 9v9 Primarchs with the Emperor and his custodians on one side, which is worth way more than multiple Primarchs and their legions. However, the traders were crafty and they opened up the Heresy by taking out three Loyalist legions, isolating the others, but most importantly of all, getting the Emperor's webway project sabotage, thus requiring the Emperor to spend almost the entire Heresy stuck on the Golden Throne, with his custodies, Sisters of Silence, and a large Imperial force getting decimated as a result. But what if the Webway project was never sabotaged and the Emperor was free to leave the Golden Throne as he pleased? What if the Emperor was able to take the fight to the traders directly? off of Terra? Would it be a stomp? Do the traders still have a chance? It's an interesting question that I'll answer today. Before we get started, I want to share a bit of a fun fact that a fair few of you may not know. For the major mini range, we have the Golden Warriors, that being Ra, the Shadow Warden, and the Golden Dreamer, and Kitten. Well, all of them, bar Kitten, are actually based on and inspired by the various angels from Diablo. Diablo angels are dope as hell. Ra is based on Imperius, with his layered shoulder guard design, loincloth, hip plates, armor, and helmet shape. Shadow Warden is based on Tyriel, with these cloth strips at the back representing the wings, shoulder plate layering, and gem positioning mimicking Tyrells alongside the layered greaves, as well as the hooded helmet variant and tabard. The Golden Dreamer is based on Anarius, with his spear, chest armor, faces on his armor, as well as his layered textured plate, not to mention the big gem that represents his whole finger on his shoulder. I quite like this theme as you can tell, with Math Ale being the next one we're currently making, but that won't be out for a few months yet at least. So yeah, a bit of a major mini plug there. Link below if you want to pick up one of these angelic banana boys or one of the dozens of other models we have. Today we'll go over what if the Emperor wasn't stuck on the Golden Throne and he was able to go after the traders head on. Now let's get into it. Okay, so to set the scene, we want to match canon as closely as possible. So the heresy does begin with the Emperor on the Golden Throne, helping stabilize and keep open the human webway while his mechanic and forces stabilized and built upon it. However, in this version, Magnus does not attempt to breach the webway in order to warn his father of Horus' betrayal. He instead honors the Edict of Nikea, and he physically heads to Terra with his legion to deliver the warning in person. Well, the first thing that would happen would be Kao shitting the bed at this unexpected turn of events. Titsnitch would stir up the warp a lot around Prospero, delaying the thousands Sons. You could honestly create your own book out of it, with the effort and challenges the Thousand Sons would face, on par with the flight of the Eisenstein or the White Scar's challenging journey home. The flesh change would also accelerate within the Legion as Titsnitch increases pressure on them. However, it has been shown that mental discipline and not using warp powers does slow or even stop the flesh change, and this version of Magnus and his Legion was more restrained, so it's not like everyone just turns into a Chaos Spawn. Either way, Magnus would make it to Terra, but in true Grimdark style, he would be slightly too late to warn the Emperor, with the events and plans of the heresy already been set into motion. For drama's sake, let's say he gets the terror just as the Iron Hands, Salamanders, and Raven Guard head to Isfun to take down Horus. You may be wondering why the Emperor wouldn't lead the Isfun counterattack himself if he isn't stuck on the Golden Throne, and the answer is that he still kinda was. His presence on the Golden Throne is what is forcibly keeping the human webway open and stable. If he hopped off, most of it would collapse and seal itself off from humans, as the webway is like a sentient organism with its own immune system that targets non-Eldar intruders. The Mechanicum was stabilizing it, meaning eventually he would not need to keep it forced open, but for now he did. Horus was also expected to be crushed pretty easily by the three Loyalist Legions, who were supposed to get backed up by the Night Lords, Wordbearers, Iron Warriors, and Alpha Legion, not betrayed by them. So the Emperor didn't want to jeopardize the Webway, which he saw as way more important than Horus's rebellion, if he didn't have to. The Heresy kicks off in similar fashion. The three Loyalist Legions are crushed, the White Scars are isolated at Chondax, the Dark Angels are sent to the corner of the galaxy, and the Ultramarines are ambushed by the Wordbearers which kicks off the Ruinstorm. The Blood Angels are sent to Cygnus Prime where they are ambushed. AKA, shit starts super bad for the Imperium. However, while this is kicking off, the Emperor devises a plan. With Magnus by his side and the webway not requiring as much effort due to it not being torn open, Magnus is able to take over and sit in his father's stead. The Emperor is now free, fully powered from the throne and is able to leave Terra. He has the Thousand Suns by his side, as well as the Imperial Fists and Space Wolves, who will recall to Terra as soon as the heresy started and never left to go to Prospero since Magnus was being a good boy. Horus, knowing that the Emperor would try come for him before he got too powerful, knew he needed to get to Molech to access the warp gate there in order to be supercharged and stand a chance against his father. The Emperor knew he needed to stop him. Molech would be the ultimate battleground. Many of the sub-heresy wars would never happen. The Night Lords would not go to Thramus to delay the Dark Angels, as Horus would need his entire force by his side if he was to clash with the Emperor directly. Likewise, the White Scars would not be hunted by the Death Guard and Emperor's children, thus would be able to make their way to Terra a lot easier. However, the Ultra Ultramarines and 
Blood Angels would still be stuck behind the Ruin Storm. Maybe the Dark Angels as well. A lot of the trader infighting would be reduced as well. However, I still think there is time for Fulgrim and Perturabo to do the Angel Exterminatus, as Fulgrim was still promised the super weapons for Perti while wishing to become a Demon Prince himself. Likewise, there would still be a Shadow Crusade by Lorga and Angron to weaken the Ultramarines and force the Ruin Storm. Corvus also makes it to the Emperor's side, like he did in canon. However, with the Emperor needing as many forces as possible, he gives Corvus the Raptor Gene Tech, however, keeps him on Terra. Corvus rebuilds the Raven Guard into the tens of thousands, not quite a full legion, but still beefy as fuck. The Emperor knows that this will come down to a mega decisive battle. He also knows he is greatly outnumbered, with only his Custodes, a weakened Raven Guard, the Imperial Fists, Thousand Sons, and Space Wolves against nine traitor legions. So his first order of business would be to try reach out to the Ultramarines, Dark Angels, and Blood Angels, as well as the White Scars, that he is alive and he needs their aid. For the story's sake, let's say there is a special world or some shit that has a Xeno device on it that can amplify psychic messages and get through the Ruin Storm. The traders also know of it, but don't want to face the Emperor in full force before Molech, so they send the Alpha Legion. Although torn, Alpharus decides to stay traitor, as he still believes that the Emperor would rather humanity die via Horus winning than the galaxy becoming a chaos-infused hellhole. The Emperor takes most of his army to this Xeno device, leaving Magnus on Terra to keep the webway stable, with Alexis Pollux and 30,000 Imperial Fists also staying behind his garrison. They reach the Xeno device world, however the Alpha Legion show off an extremely impressive display of power, misdirection, and scheming, using their legion of nearly half a million marines. It was always suspected that the Alpha Legion's size was the largest due to their low casualty method of war and stable gene seed, but now Alpharis proves it. Through a lot of battling and trial, the Emperor reaches the Xeno devices and begins broadcasting to his lost sons, while Dawn Russ, Korax, and their legions contend with the Alpha Legion. This is just as Alpharis had planned though, as he sneaks up on the Emperor and prepares to assassinate him. As he strikes, his spear is blocked by another. Constantine Valdor parries his blow and pushes him back. These two had briefly dueled before in canon lore, with both believing themselves to be the greater warrior. Now, they can finally prove it. The Emperor is totally engrossed in reaching out to his Primarch son, so he cannot help Valdor. The two spear-wielding demigods clash in a flurry of strikes, blindingly fast, so that even a space ring would be unable to follow along. Both warriors land blows, both warriors bleed, Alpharis begins to speak of how what he is doing, he is doing for the Emperor, for humanity. Valdor stays quiet. Eventually, however, towards the crescendo of their duel, Valdor has had enough. He cuts off Alpharis' frantic ranting with one word. Loyalty. He says, The thing that you do not understand is that true loyalty is not scheming, manipulating, or interpreting your own duty to fulfill your own prideful desires. It is following without question not because you want to or believe in the cause, but because you are loyal. I know I am a creature, made by the Emperor as a tool to fit his design. I know I've never lived free and likely never will. Yet I do not, as I have loyalty above all else. Now shut up up and die, traitor. Valdor pulls off a stunning move, weaving past a perfect killing blow from Alpharius as he steps inside the Alpha Legion Primarch's guard, Guardian Spear whirling. He slashes it up across Alpharius' chest, then within a millisecond, it is spin and cut three more times. Blood sprays from Alpharius' chest as he stumbles back. Despite the horrific injury though, Alpharius strikes back, a blindingly fast blow that Valdor, in his exposed state, will not be able to stop. However, it never lands holding in place a centimeter away from Valdor's heart. The Emperor steps forward, his psychic might holding back the blow and locking the wounded Alpharis in place. Alpharis says, My lord, I did this for- Enough, Alpharius, the Emperor says softly. Enough. You were to be my blade in the shadow, my fail safe against treachery, but you became the very thing you were made to safeguard against. You do not know me better than myself. The amount of lives that would not have been lost had you remained loyal. The amount of pain. This is enough. With a look at Valdor, the Captain General strikes Alpharis' head off with a clean single stroke, and with a flash of light, Alpharis is no more. With Alpharius gone and the Emperor re-entering the battle, the Alpha Legion breaks and flees back into the void. The signal was sent and received. The armies of Imperium Secundus rush to brave the Ruinstorm and push to Molech, just as the White Scars and Vulcan do as well hoping they can reach it in time. The Emperor and his fleet arrive at Moloch as it is under siege. The traders have already landed on the surface, with all nine traitor legions. Mortarian, Angron, and Fulgrim have all ascended into their Demon Prince forms, hence the defenders are falling much faster than in canon. The Emperor leads a spear tip to break the traders' orbitable blockade, using his flagship and the phalanx to punch a hole through the heretics. In return, the traders use the word bearer megaships, the Abyss class, to fight back and prevent the loyalists from taking the space advantage. 
The Emperor is able to land himself, most of his custodies, Dawn, Rus, and Korax alongside a few hundred thousand Astartes outside of the planet's capital, which is built on top of the warp gate. They fight in a mad open field battle to reach the city, clashing head on with hundreds of thousands of traitor marines, an engagement that makes the Isfan drop site massacre look like a skirmish. The Emperor takes on Mortarian, Angron, and Fulgrim simultaneously, while Kurz, Lorga, and Perturabo take on Dawn, Korax, and Rus. Now, I won't spend an hour detailing like six fucking epic ass Primarch jewels that take place in one battle, as awesome as that would be, but you can use your imagination. All I'm saying is that this would be a dope amount of grud matches. Corvus vs. Lorga, Dawn vs. Perturabo, Anyone vs. Kurz. The Emperor's fight with these demonic sons would be more symbolic than physical, like he is fighting them on a spiritual level. As he overcomes each of them, he feels lost in sadness, mixed in with regret and compassion. He promises that although he destroys them now, he will find them and bring them back. He will make his sons whole again. As Mortarion, the last of the three, is cast down, the Emperor charges forth into the city. He reaches the warp portal just as Horus defeats his last defenders. The Emperor implores Horus not to step through, that it isn't too late to make things right. Horus looks at the Emperor, his face conflicted and sad, but then it hardens with resolve. He simply says, LIAR! and steps through the portal. Moments later, he steps out again, bursting with Chaos energy that his mortal shell can barely contain. In canon, Chaos gave him a big boost from the portal, but it was gradually increasing. However, with the Emperor here, Chaos just turbocharges him, putting their own power on the line for this duel. The Horus that walks out of the portal is almost as powerful as the one that fights the Emperor in canon, the two gods duel, their battle matching much of what happened in canon. For story's sake, we'll also add in Loken, Jon, and Alanis all being present as well, following a similar journey to canon to try save the Emperor's life. It appears the duel will go the same way, the Emperor winning but being mortally wounded, but this time too far from Terra to be saved. However, before the duel can reach this point and Horus can mortally wound his father, an explosion of light enters the room. The flaming majestic form of Magnus the Red appears, elevated to near godlike power from being on the Golden Throne. Despite being an astral projection, he radiates power and he blasts Horus across the room away from the Emperor. He then says, We are here, Father. All of us. Before psychically teleporting Dawn, Korax, Rus, and Valdor. Then he also brings in Gilliman, Sanguinius, the Khan, Lion, and Vulcan, who have all just arrived in system with their legions. In orbit, with the arrival of the new fleets, the traders are getting obliterated, especially when the Alpha Legion contingent opens fire upon their traitor kin from behind, the loyalist Omegon showing his hand. It's a massacre. Horus faces his father and nine loyalist brothers. He roars a challenge and charges. However, even with his immense power, he is no match. He is cut apart with axe, spear, blade, lightning claw, and warp energy. Chunks of his armor, flesh, and chaotic energy being wiped off him with each blow. Eventually, he falls to his knees, his blood and power flowing freely out of him. The Emperor says, I wait for you, and I forgive you just like he does in canon, before striking the Warmaster down, ending the heresy. With the Emperor intact, his nine loyal sons alive, and the traders completely annihilated, the setting enters the mythical Imperium Ascendant. So begins the true golden age of mankind, as they reach their full potential, eclipsing even the Elder Empire at its peak, as it subjugates or annihilates all other factions. The tower merge and are immediately vassalized or destroyed. The Craftworld sign a treaty that puts them under the protection and control of the Imperium, and the Dark Elder are pushed back to Komara, which itself is then leveled. The Necrons emerge and are destroyed or forced to capitulate to the Imperium's demands, and the Tyranids enter the Milky Way only to find it completely fortified and unconsumable. The Emperor, seeing humanity flourish, once again fades back into the shadows as one by one his sons step down and enter a life of peace. The Space Marine Legions become obsolete, and a now psychic human race is powerful enough to freely choose its own path forward. Grim darkness is banished, and in its place, hope remains. Who knows, perhaps the Emperor, with the help of Magnus, Malkador, Erda, and the Golden Throne, is able to reform the trade of Primarchs and purge their souls of taint, bringing back Ferris as well. Oh yeah, and Erebus dies like a fucking bitch, alone and abandoned by his dying gods. So yeah, if Magnus didn't fuck everything up, the future could have been very, very bright. If you enjoyed the video and you want to support the channel, then pick up a major mini, especially one of the Golden Warriors in honor of the Emperor. Hit the subscribe button and hit the real subscribe button for more noble, bright content. Join the Discord for more memes and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.